Hi everyone, welcome to Babbel, where this week I'll be chatting with debut author Lorraine Brown. Her new book, Uncoupling, is out today, the 18th of February, and is a modern romance, escapism, exactly what you need right now to make you feel good. So I really recommend you head out and buy it and then listen to this interview where we'll talk about the process of writing it. Hi, Lorraine, how are you? Hi, good, thank you. How are you? I'm very well, thanks. It's actually a bit sunny today, so <laughs> I've, I've been in the gloomy snow for a while, so it's quite yeah, nice. not that sunny here. <laughs> <laughs> Where are you based? I'm in London, North London. Amazing. Um, and well, so, ground. yeah, how's this, how's this all been for you? R publishing a book is kind of quite stressful and with lots of unexpected turns the best of times. So when you've got a pandemic to boost your debut along, it must be quite strange. Yeah, um, it is strange. I'm finding this lockdown easier than the last one, I guess. Um, I don't know why. I yeah, I think we're all just a bit used to it now. Uh, aren't we? <laughs> yeah, exactly. And maybe there's some chink of light at the end of the tunnel. Um, and yeah. I very much get excited about, um, you know, my, my book launch. And I had a moment maybe a few weeks ago where I was kind of feeling a bit flat and a bit sort of, well, no, I'm not going to see it at a bookshop and I'm not going to go out for you know, celebratory dinners and I'm not going to have a book yeah. party as such. But then, you know, got to put it in perspective, haven't you? And I am actually having a launch event um on zoom which will be fun um and i'm sure it'll still be lovely and i'll get to my book at some point in the shop <laughs> yeah well as i was recently um chatting to nima shah who's also um got a debut coming out and on the same day as your book actually and she was saying how at least with kind of the lack of actual travel for tours you've got higher energy for all the different events that you'll be doing because mm -hmm. you're not on and off trains getting getting around the country for your different launches and and things like that yeah that's it actually I'm so, in a, a debut 21 group together um and I think she mentioned I, I had to listen to to her um, podcast and I think she mentioned didn't she that she finding that really supportive that I do sort of meeting other authors in the same situation catching yeah. up you know, a couple of times a month on zoom it's really nice yeah, absolutely. It sounds like the kind of support bubble you need with something so big, but with kind of not that many people to share it with if everyone's at home. And so how long have you been writing Uncoupling? And did any of the writing happen during the lockdown, the first lockdown at least? Yeah, I so I started it in, a long time ago, 2015. Um, and I entered a competition for the Bath Novel Award. And I hadn't finished the book, I'd written about 40,000 words. So I sent those, I think I said I should send maybe one chapter or wrote an opening extract of. And I knew that if you got long listed for the award, you'd have to have the full manuscript. And I didn't for a minute think I was going to get long listed, but I thought, well, you know, just in case, I suppose I better, you know, push forward and try and get it done. It might give me some kind of impetus. So I pushed forward, but I didn't get it done. And then I was long listed by some miracle. <laughs> it was so exciting. It was probably the first, you know, that was the first sense I had of, well, maybe. I can do this. Maybe you know, I'm in the chance. Maybe I can write a little bit. Um, but then I had a month to finish the whole manuscript. Um, so it was lots of kind of yeah, stressful late nights. And I had a day job at the time, and I was um, I had a youngish child who was probably yeah about three at the time. So yeah, it was, it was quite stressful. Um, if I got it in with one minute to spare, literally, I think I sent it up at eleven fifty nine p.m. The deadline was midnight. <laughs> And, you know, what a surprise, I didn't get shortlisted because, quite frankly, it was a first draft. <laughs> but, you know, that set me off on a, on a path of thinking, you know, there's something here, I can, I can do this. Absolutely. And just that um, then pressure to do it in that time means that once you have a draft, there's so much work you can do. And so, yes, yeah, so kind of a relief to then have something to work from after that. So yeah. if I read correctly, you finished your first book in 2014. So that's obviously not uncoupling then. What no, was that? <laughs> that was, yeah. So that was something I started, I think 2012, I did um, a writing course at Birkbeck, which is part of the University of London. And it was like one evening a week or something. And it was a novel writing module. So we started writing a novel. And um, I sort of continued after after the course, we formed like a writing group. Um, and that book got, you know, a few little snippets of positive feedback from agents, but ultimately it was 
rejected by about 25 agents. And they, any feedback I did get pretty much said the same thing, which is that you can write, but this, you know, this kind of story is, is difficult to sell. There's not enough of a hook. And I didn't really know what a hook was at that time. Mm. Which they need a hook. How do I write? How do I come up with a hook? So when I sort of put that aside and started writing Uncoupling in 2015, I thought, I thought a bit more about this book and read up about it. And, um, because I kind of had this kind of commercial head on because I had this day job that I wasn't enjoying at all. And I knew that I wanted to change my career. I didn't want, you know, I didn't want to spend years writing a novel that then wasn't really published. I wanted to get it published and I wanted to change my career and change my life, really. So, yeah, I really put a lot of thought into, into that. Mm, and it must be so difficult trying to be true to kind of creativity and the art of it and then actually being realistic and saying, well, I, yeah, I don't want to write something no one reads. <laughs> so it is yeah. important to have that commercial hat on while you're doing it. Yeah, I think so. I was really interested to see that uncoupling when it's going to be published in the US is going to be called the Paris Connection instead. Who makes those kinds of decisions and what was your original title? Well, yeah, so my original title was The Paris Train. That's what I submitted it to, um, you know, various competitions and, and to agents. Um, but I got my UK deal and my US deal at around the same time. So the editors were working together on the book, which was you know, amazing. But there was obviously a lot more kind of back and forth than there might usually be, especially about the title. And I think the Americans felt that they wanted to keep Paris in the title. They felt that really appealed to American readers, but they didn't like the Paris train because I think they, they thought it had some kind of connotation with like a saga, more of a historical. Right. Novel. So, yeah. <laughs> eventually, after much back and forth, we came up with the Paris connection. Yeah, that's really interesting uh, to think about as well with in terms of kind of the American reader not having the Paris train being a really obvious thing for people in Europe who would hop on a train to, to Paris is kind of less relatable to an American audience. Yeah, I know. You don't, you don't think about those things, do you? Mm-hmm. And also, uncoupling isn't, I don't think, something they're familiar with in terms of, because obviously here it has the kind of meaning of the relationship uncoupling, but also the yeah. train uncoupling. But I don't mm-hmm. think that's something that's sort of... No, absolutely. And so you've touched on it um, now already briefly, but I'd love to know kind of about that path from young girl going into the world and debut author and kind of what's happened in between in your your journey to this point. Yeah, I mean, I feel like it's been a long journey. And I feel like when I look at my CV, I just think, my God, it's literally all over the place. (laughs) When I was a young girl, I grew up in this kind of small suburban town, which was I don't know. I found it difficult. I found it very boring. I didn't feel I didn't particularly connected to it. But it was just outside London, so I'd very much be, as soon as I was old enough, going into London all the time, and then I'd be kind of surrounded by you know, excitement and fashion and I don't know, music. I was really excited by fashion, so I went to fashion college my first day to school and actually did fashion writing, fashion journalism. That was probably my first foray into writing, but also in a more kind of journalistic way. And I worked on magazines for a while. But well, that was cool. That was kind of very glamorous at that time. I don't know if it's probably not like that now, but, you know, I got to fly to Morocco and shoot. And I don't know. <laughs> it was an exciting thing. It was really, very cool. And I used to go home to my mum and dad's in my little town, and that was a very different kind of life. Um, did that for a while, and then I decided that I had, I'd always had this dream of being an actor, but I'd never really had the guts to try. So I started doing some acting lessons in the evenings. Really loved it as much as I thought I would. And so um, I went to drama school for a year. Which was um, interesting. <laughs> oh God, it's so tough. I just really <laughs> why should I put myself through that? It was just so hard, and you know, just get criticised all the time, like to the point mm. where you're just crying. It sounds a bit dramatic, but everybody was just crying and storming out and not feeling they could do it and sobbing. And it was just, I just kind of think, why does it have to be that way? Um, yeah. um, so I came out there and tried for about seven years to be an actor. Went to LA for a couple of months. Um, that was fun as well. Um, but, you know, it never really took off. Mm-hmm. There's obviously a lot of rejection there as well. Um, and so like was, a perfect training ground for an author. Yeah, <laughs> Learn I, how to be rejected at drama school and then it won't be as painful. When yeah. you well, that's what I thought, but sometimes it did still feel as painful. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah, then I was basically temping, doing lots of secretarial jobs, and then eventually thought, right, okay, I've got no money. I'm going to have to take a permanent job. Yeah. I'm going to have to hope that something will happen with my acting and I'll be able to, you know, 
be free of that. So I took this job working as a school secretary um, in Hampstead in London. And um, I, I was, you know, it was fine for a while. <laughs> and, you know, I was just like, this is not what I want to do in my life. What else can I do that's creative that, you know, will give me that kind of joy? Mm. I started thinking about writing and I sort of thought to myself, that's as ridiculous as being an actor. You know, that's not going to work. It's very difficult. But I gave it a go. And okay. I started classes and I started writing. And yeah, I'm so glad I did. Because, <laughs> yes. you know, at least with writing, you can do it on your own. Mm-hmm. In your own you know, with acting, it's very much you've got to be casting something. Isn't it? Absolutely. Mm-hmm. And you can do it during a pandemic. So who knew yeah. that would be an element that would be factoring in? Yeah. And so you've done all these things. I think I even read that you were a plastic surgeon's assistant or you worked in an office with a plastic surgeon. So yeah. the scope is really quite large. Do you think <laughs> that the scope of experience that you've had filters into your fiction? Yeah, I mean, I hope it does. Um, mm. Certainly the stuff about being a secretary and PA, I feel has come through in my work a lot in terms of um, career dissatisfaction. And, you know, it just wasn't for me, I suppose. Mm. And it's not that, you know, the job itself was bad. But just you know, the dynamics of working in an office, that's something else that I'm really interested in. Mm. The sort of competition, the sort of hierarchy, gossip and all that, <laughs> all that side of things. Uh, you know, that's something that I've really tried to bring a little bit into uncoupling, but in, into my next book as well. Mm. Well, yeah, it, it does seem like... Oops, sorry, I just lost my train of thought. <laughs> so it does seem like your approach to things is I don't want to do this anymore so I'll learn how to do the thing that I do want to do it's kind of like I'd like to be an actor let's go to drama school I'd like to be a writer I'm going to do a creative writing course so it's a really good approach approach to fixing things so many people just sit wishing they'd done other stuff so you're really mm. proactive with that and yeah I think so well, the downside of that is that you know I had no money for a long time so my friends that you know went to university then got the job and sort of worked through you know, through the ranks. So when I was sort of, yeah, at the point where I was going out all the time, you know, I'd never have any money and they'd have money. Mm. Clothes, and, you know, they were nice holidays. And so, yeah, that was the downside of it, I suppose. But, you know, always I had that in my head. I've got to get to somewhere where I'm going to feel fulfilled mm. and <laughs> love what I'm doing. Right. So then in 2018, you became a mentee on the Penguin Random House Right Now programme. Could you tell me a little bit about what that is and what your experience of it was? Mm, yeah, so it's a scheme they run um, and it's aimed at writers that are currently underrepresented in the publishing industry. Um, and I applied again with an opening extract of the book. And then they sort of, first of all, invite 150 people to come to like a day. Um, and it was at the Strand, at the Penguin's main offices. So that was really exciting. <laughs> and I was sitting on a table with kind of editors and other writers. And we sort of met various publishing people and had talks. That was almost enough for me. I didn't think I'd get past that point. And then the next point was they shortlisted some people. Um, and because I went through stages and eventually I got chosen to be one of 11 mentees, um, which was, again, another point at which I thought, okay, there you go, I can do this. this. <laughs> yeah. I, went, I was sort of matched with an editor for a year and we worked together um, on the manuscript and uncoupling. And then also in between that times when we get to meet meet up with, with the other authors and have kind of motivational talks and industry chat. So yeah, it really oh. felt really exciting and, and supportive. And have you always been writing books with uh, kind of romantic plots? I don't want to necessarily call it a romance. I think it's kind of ends up typecasting it into a genre, which it's not. It's kind of a modern. It's 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 just fiction really, and there's a romantic plot line. Mm. But I wonder, uh, you said from a young girl in an, an interview that I read that you were always reading the Sweet Dream series and loving novels about romance. And do you feel like that's something that you actively try and put into your books? Yeah, I mean, it didn't really feel like a like a choice, I suppose. When I thought about writing a book when I was on that course, in that book that I mentioned, I sort of knew that I wanted to write about relationships. Mm. Um, and I didn't really have it in my head then about genre, I suppose. I mean, uncoupling is marketed very much as a rom-com. And obviously that, that sort of genre thing doesn't really come so much later, does it? I don't think when you start out as a writer, you think about what genre the book might be in. Um, and, you know, my favourite books of all time are all love stories. Okay. For example, One Day by David Nichols, The Girl with a Pearl Earring, uh, Normal People. 
again. All you know, they're, they're the books that I love, and they're all about really, you know, a relationship or. Mm. And it seems point. like writers never really go into the writing process. It seems like a marketing thing that it becomes a genre or how it gets sold is kind of none of your business, really. It's yeah, you know, yeah. I've written the book and you can you can sell it how you think it'll sell. Yeah, yeah that's right. I think you've just got to write what you like like writing. Although, you know, yeah. saying that when I originally finished uncoupling and I sort of was finishing up on the Penguin Random House scheme and I started sending it out to agents, I was still getting a lot of rejections. Yeah. So I had to kind of rethink what you know, what's going wrong here? And actually, what was going wrong was it wasn't quite fitting into a genre. Yeah. So what I had to do, and what they suggested I, I do, was to read a lot of romantic comedy. So I think at the time, Beth O'Leary's The Flat Show was just big, was really big. So, you know, reading things like that to see what, what, what she was doing that I wasn't doing. And it really, something clicked in my head and I did another draft and that's when um, it started getting interest from agents. So I think, you know, when you get to a certain point, maybe you do need to start thinking about where it fits in the market. Yeah, well, this kind of theme of rejection is a really interesting one because <laughs> it's ultimately you're never really fully prepared for it, it seems. You can't you can't expect, you, you just don't know what the level to which authors are dealing with it until until you're doing it, I assume, based on based on what people have said. And I wonder how you kept writing, how you kept doing it, how you kept doing the edits when faced with so much of this rejection. Mm. Um, I think I'd learned from, you know, from doing the acting as well, that it would, that feeling would pass. You know, it mm. feel like a bit like, I don't know, I was used to think when I got a rejection for the book or for a role, that it would feel like, I would feel heartbroken, like a sort of end of a relationship or something. It was that sort of feeling, but I sort of knew it wouldn't last very long. Yeah. It maybe last a day or two. And so I think I just got to the point with the book where I was thinking, I'm, I'm not going to feel great for another couple of days. And I'd maybe try and distract myself by watching you know, some nice TV. Or <laughs> well, I thought, you know, just get through those two days. And then I knew I would feel better. And then I would just get back to it, see what I could learn from it, and just push forward, basically. Mm. I suppose it's also really reassuring, re just acknowledging if you think of all the wonderful books you've read and how there's actually there's a finite number that can be published by a publisher per year. It can sometimes completely be a it's not you, it's it's not me, it's you <laughs> um, mm. situation with that kind of thing. It's not that your book's not good, it's just that it's not right for the market at that time, or someone else is doing something kind of similar, or it could be it could be so many things. Yeah, definitely. And I think when I first started submitting my first book in I guess 2012, 2013. I don't think romantic comedy was, was very popular. I think that was around the time that psychological thriller was just sort of taking over. And so, you know, perhaps if I'd submitted Uncoupling then, it, that wouldn't have been picked up either. You know, it's, it's a lot about timing as well, as you say. Yeah, and certainly now I think the, I think Uncoupling's hitting the market at a really wonderful time because everyone can just feel, it's, it is feel good, it's, but not, not necessarily in a, it's, it's not a, it's, it's very, deep in terms of relationships and um what's going on but it also just it makes you kind of forget that you're stuck at home in a pandemic and in lockdown mm. and and so I, yeah I think everyone really enjoy that and <laughs> you, yeah you mentioned that you're working on a new a new a next book what what is it can you tell us about it yeah sure um well I'm still at very early stages of it so I, I basically started writing it what do you think when I guess around about the first lockdown spring time. Um, and I took a long time to plan it this time, which is something I didn't do with uncoupling. Uncoupling took me a long time to write, I think, because I didn't really plan it that carefully and therefore I had to, have to redraft about a hundred times. Um, but with this, I thought, right, I'm going to sit down and plan it really carefully. And luckily at that time, there were loads of, you know, as a reaction to lockdown, lots of online events and festivals. And so I joined up to all of those. And that was really motivating. You know, especially stuff on plotting. I did a whole course with Save the Cat, you know, that um, that screenwriting book. Mm. Really, um, and it, it was sort of really late at night, it was a broadcast from America. So I did that and, you know, just really carefully plotted the whole thing. And then when my little boy went back to school briefly, he went back in July, I started writing um, the main manuscript. And I just got it done really quickly, actually, because I planned it so carefully, I think. Um, 
So it's a, a very different experience. So now I've just got my first um, little edit back from my editor when I'm kind of restructuring bits of it and that kind of thing. But it's it's basically set in London, which <laughs> I don't know. I felt like I don't know. I'm I'm not very good at writing about places that I can't sort of that I've never been to or that I can't go to. Mm-hmm. When I was writing Uncoupling, even though I'd been to Paris and Amsterdam before, I, I very much felt like I needed to go back and picture mm-hmm. these characters in those places. And so with this book, I just thought, well, okay, well, I can't go anywhere. And actually, I really want to write a book about London because it means a lot to me. I really love it. I think it's, you know, it's an exciting place to be yeah. and to write about. So I set it in a London apartment block and it's about two people who live opposite each other and have their own things going on and don't realise that actually what they need is each other. Oh, that sounds that sounds lovely, and it just sounds like something that gives you a, a more real side of London as well. I find that a lot of the stuff that you do read about London is um, not just people who live there, which there are plenty of. <laughs> and yeah, definitely. And I want it to be kind of. I want to capture the kind of because I live in a block of flats, and it's so diverse in terms of who lives here. And mm. I want to capture that in my story. You know, all the different types of people that you meet from all different places and different situations. Mm. Well, so were you able to do a kind of research trip to Paris while you were writing? Yes, I was, which was great. I just went for the day twice. And that's the great thing about living in London. You can get on mm-hmm. the other star quickly. Um, you can just go for the day. Um, but obviously, yeah, it's tiring. <laughs> <laughs> just walking around all day. But yes, right. Just stop for a glass of wine here or <laughs> yeah. um, some sort of cake here. And then just found all these little kind of hidden places. Because... Oh, wow. um, my male protagonist, Leo, is from Paris. I still wanted to feel very authentic in, in terms of the places he would be taking Anna to. I thought that actually that was funny because originally I wrote it like that, but then um, my American editor said to me that she felt that American readers would also like to see some sort of more quintessential Paris. So then I had to go back to Paris again <laughs> to think about okay, what can I do around the Eiffel Tower? What can I do in the Champs Elysees? Mm. Let's get the Seine in. And um, yeah. Yeah. Even that's a bit of a mixture of touristy parts and yeah. more obscure parts. Well, that relationship between those two characters does suit that because he's both trying to show her the hidden gems of Paris while also making her love the the things that make Paris so incredible, like the yeah, like the different monuments and the um, yeah, all the beautiful sights. And you really have given us such a, I did feel like I'd had a little trip to Paris, despite the fact that I was actually <laughs> tucked up in bed in Sussex. So. I know. No, I'm desperate to go back. And actually, ha- having gone back to the Eiffel Tower, it's one of those things that you just take for granted, isn't it? You see it so often, mm. pictures or, you know, TV, whatever. Um, but when I went back to the Eiffel Tower with Hannah and Leo in mind and thinking about what could happen to them there, I just kind of appreciated how stunning it is. And, you know, I don't know, it felt really magical, which it hadn't done when I'd seen it before. Yeah. Well, so the last question I'd like to ask you is, what is psychodynamic counselling, which um, you have a diploma in? And, um, yeah, just yeah. one more one more thing. Yeah, so that was actually interesting, because I, when I was working at the school, I was thinking to myself, what else can I do in my life? Um I sort of thought I want to be a writer, but as I explained earlier, I thought that's probably not going to happen. That's what I thought in my head. So I thought, what else can I do that's a bit more sensible? And I'd always been interested in counselling. Um, so I started this course. And psychodynamic counselling is basically, I guess it has its roots in psychoanalysis. So it's thinking about bringing the unconscious into the conscious. So we'll talk a lot about somebody's childhood, the relationship with their parents, how that's impacted, how they are now in relationships how they react to conflict, their behaviours, that kind of thing. Um, so I was training for that at the sack at the same time as writing a company, which, again, brought an element of stress to my life because <laughs> I'm really busy. But on the other hand, everything I was learning on my course, it was just amazing. So it enabled me to go back and, like, you know, do a redraft and add in so many more layers, you know, to what was happening with Hannah and why she was in these relationships and, mm. and what she yeah. might be looking for. It's kind of like a crash course in how to write a three-dimensional character, isn't it? Just... It really is. <laughs> one of my feedback for my first novel was that it didn't feel three-dimensional. And so it was just a very, you know, useful for me that I was doing this course. But yeah, as you say, it just naturally fed in. Mm. Well, wonderful. It's been so great to chat to you and kind of hear the making of Uncoupling because I so enjoyed reading it. And thank you for coming on today. And the book is published today uh the 18th of february 
and we hope everybody goes straight out after listening to this interview and buys a copy and then tells us what they think because we want to know. <laughs> Thank you so much again, Lorraine, for coming on and thanks to our audience for listening. Thanks Bye. So Bye.